Um, now I have the pleasure of introducing Victor Thanikov. Victor is from the University of Alabama in Birmingham and is going to talk about aging and senescence in IPF. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the organizing committee and, and the uh, Vanderbilt group, Tim and Lisa, for putting this wonderful program together. Um, it's my first time to IPF Summit, and I've really learned a lot, and I hope uh, what I'm going to share with you has, uh, will shed some light on some of uh, the controversies that have already been, been raised. Um, so. Uh, uh, Hal asked me to make this fast, so I'll try to go through it. I probably have more slides than uh, can be spoken up in, in 15 minutes, and Paul's back here, so I wouldn't want to delay your uh, uh, privilege to listen to Paul Noble soon, so I'm, I'm going to go as fast as I can. Uh, so this is my outline, and I'm going to discuss this idea of fibrosis being uh, a disease that, or process that results from impaired epithelial regeneration, and I think you heard a lot about this already. There's clearly a loss of cellular homeostasis, uh, and the pathology, as variable as it can be, uh, does um, clearly show that, that there is a, lo a loss of homeostasis and, and the lung architecture is altered that gives rise to a lot of the clinical physiology and phenotype that we see in IPF patients. So I'm going to mainly focus on this idea of uh, GERO science, which is uh, applying the biology of aging to understanding pulmonary fibrosis. If you, uh, if you agree and, uh, on the basic premise that IPF is a disease of aging, which I think most people uh, would accept. So two short, very quick uh, thoughts on that. One is the redox imbalance that uh, I'd like to share some data on that with you, as well as um, altered bioenergetics and cellular metabolism as a potential driver of disease progression. So um, I'd uh, like to start with this slide where, you know, you've heard a lot about the epithelium, and clearly that's where uh, a lot of the risk of susceptibility to developing fibrosis, I think, clearly begins. Um, but I think the lung as a complex structure uh, has uh, other cellular components, and the vasculature here is critically important for that. Um, a gas exchange across this thin alveolar membrane, but there are also other cell types such as fibroblasts that you know, I think you're going to hear this uh, at the next talk from Tushar about how this, these fibroblasts uh, contribute to the alveolar epithelial cell niche and a love for regeneration uh, uh, to occur. Uh, and so this um, uh, constant interaction between the epithelium and the mesenchyme is critically important for disease uh, pathogenesis. Um, so again, the idea that a failure in regeneration gives rise to fibrosis, and if you look at our animal models, uh, clearly that's what we are trying to recapitulate. Um, now, you just heard from Paul about the idea that without injury, uh, which may also be what we refer to as maintenance regeneration uh, over a lifetime may potentially give rise to fibrosis, uh, and that's important. There are also multiple mechanisms of regeneration that we uh, don't often consider, although we focus on adult stem cells, but the de-differentiation of so-called terminally differentiated cells are also critically important. And I think the concept that that fibrosis, once it develops, which could be an adaptive response, could then uh, actually uh, deter or impair uh, normal latent regenerative capacity uh, in organ systems like the lung also deserves some consideration. Um, so we've kind of approached this from an evolutionary perspective and tried to argue that all of the molecular and cellular mechanisms that give rise to fibrosis are actually conserved probably to deal with infections um, and also for normal wound healing. 
and that over a lifetime, due to various challenges in our environment, which is constantly changing in our industrialized world, and we're all aging, we're now living longer than we've ever have on, uh, on Earth, and I think that's contributed to a lot of age-related diseases. There are clearly genetic susceptibilities and epigenetic alterations that drive specific cell phenotypes that give rise to the uh, disease process. And these, this concept of antagonistic pleiotropy is something that I've really, uh, that's been advocated as a theory for why we age. Uh, there are certain genes or networks, uh, even or cellular processes, such as senescence, may have uh, evolved early to be protective in life, and clearly senescence is an anti-cancer mechanism, is well accepted, but that after reproductive age, when you've lost selection pressure for some of those phenotypes, that it can actually contribute to diseases of aging, and uh, cellular senescence definitely does contribute uh, to several diseases of aging, including potentially IPF. Um, so, uh, we're all uh, aging as we uh, you know, this is uh, summit number three, I think, and Hal, we've been at several meetings. Hal doesn't seem to age much, but we're all aging. Uh, we're living in an aging world. We're currently in the U.S. Uh, it's about 15% um, um, uh, of our population is uh, above the age of 65. And uh, you can see that there is some variation across the globe. Clearly in, the, uh, in Europe, there is a much higher percentage of, of, elder, of the elderly population. Uh, but or, as um, we move forward, um, uh, about 15, 20, even 2050 here, you can see that uh, the US population now is going to be in the mid-20s in terms of our percentage. And actually, for the first time on, in history, it's predicted that uh, pay, uh, individuals, the population over age 60 would outnumber children. Uh, and so this is clearly going to be a challenge um, in terms of uh, dealing with diseases of aging. And um, you've heard already uh, that there are um, several uh, diseases to consider. The main one we are dealing with here at this summit is clearly IPF, which has uh, an age-dependent increase in both the incidence and uh, prevalence of that disease. COPD and uh, in, uh, susceptibility to infection are also uh, important considerations um, as we age. So um, if you uh, ad adhere or accept the basic premise that uh, our susceptibility to these age-related diseases have something to do uh, with aging biology, then it may uh, be worth uh, paying attention to some of these so-called hallmarks. Uh, and this is a starting point to understand uh, how we age um, over a lifetime. And you can see there are several th common themes here that have already been discussed. Telomere attrition, genomic instability, epigenetic alterations that may be re uh, resulting from environmental exposures, um, and loss of proteostasis. You heard about ER stress. You didn't hear a lot about metabolism or mitochondrial dysfunction, but those are also, could be very important in IPF, stem cell exhaustion and altered intercellular communication. And as you just heard from Paul, um, telomere attrition could give rise to either stem cell exhaustion or cellular senescence. So there's some overlap between um, these different uh, phenotypes. So the exciting thing um, from a practical, pragmatic, and uh, clinical perspective is that uh, uh, there are now ways to actually um, target some of these hallmarks uh, with the kind of therapies that you will see uh, highlighted here. Uh, there's actually a study of metformin that is ongoing to increase longevity and something that I'm going to discuss a bit in terms of as a potential antifibrotic uh, strategy. And I'm going to share very quickly in two slides uh, what we've uh, thought about in terms of uh, senescence uh, in IPF. So as, as you've already heard, there are a number of upstream regulators of senescence, telomere shortening, oxidative stress, oncogenic uh, stimulation, DNA damage responses that can alter gene expression 
and uh, induce um, epigenetic changes and alterations in chromatin that can regulate gene expression. But they typically seem to go through two different uh, pathways, either the P53, P21 pathway or the P16 pathway that then has effects on downstream cyclin-dependent kinases and uh, retinoblastoma gene that then uh, essentially shuts down proliferation, but also has effects on driving um, what you heard alluded to earlier of uh, the uh, senescence-associated secretory phenotype, which is critical uh, in uh, senescence. So I know that I've also aged rapidly over the, <laughs> over the years, but back in 1995 when I was a teenager, uh, actually when I was doing my fellowship <laughs> at Tufts, we discovered an interesting biochemical activity uh, of TGF beta that induced uh, the generation of reactive oxygen species in a number of different cell types, including fibroblasts. And that was several years before a whole gene family was cloned, and these belonged to the uh, NADPH oxidase family that's critically involved in innate uh, immunity. Uh, and since then, we have discovered that this uh, gene is critically important uh, in fibrosis of the lung in animal models, and that's now been replicated in several other organ systems, including the liver and the heart and the kidney. Uh, and more recently, we've shown that this may uh, uh, contribute to the redox imbalance that we think drives some of these uh, age-related phenotypes. And more recently, we've looked at metabolic reprogramming by this enzyme uh, NOX4. Um, so just to summarize this uh, paper from a couple of years ago, what we've shown is that in young mice that are injured with bleomycin, that there is actually a self-limited uh, fibrotic response that resolves over several weeks. And this is associated with an upregulation of NOX4, as well as a counter-regulatory or compensatory or adaptive response if, of the NRF2 antioxidant response that, uh, that leads to a self-limited senescence that is associated with the ability for, of myofibroblasts to undergo apoptosis, but in age mice, uh, and this was 18 uh, months uh, old C57 black 6 mice that we found were dramatically uh, different in that they did not, not only had they have high levels of NOx4 being induced, but they did not have this uh, counter-regulatory response of NRF2 upregulation. This led to a very sustained senescent phenotype of myofibroblasts that that we think alters their ability uh, to normally resolve fibrosis since they don't undergo that program cell death and clearance of uh, those myofibroblasts. So just a, a, a quick uh, data piece from that paper uh, where we showed that P16 staining, and this is one of the markers of senescence, you can see that it lights up the epithelium but also uh, the, in the fibroblastic foci, you can see that uh, 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 the majority of these fibro myofibroblasts and fibroblasts are also expressing P16. So not only is there uh, evidence of cell cycle arrest uh, of the epithelium, but also of the myofibroblasts. So this idea of proliferating myofibroblasts, we don't really see that. Even by KI67 staining, you will see a few epithelial cells that are positive for KI67, but within the foci itself, uh, there are very few proliferating cells. So this was recently confirmed by the uh, Mayo Group that uh, just earlier this year, and they had much uh, prettier uh, staining of P16 here within those same uh, IPF lungs where, again, you can see that the epithelium lights up, but so also uh, does the uh, myofibroblast uh, underneath those, uh, uh, those epithelia. Um, and th what they did in this paper was to target uh, the senescent cells with uh, a pharmaceutical or pharmacological strategy that um, was a combination of dasatinib and quercetin that um, is referred to as a senolytic cocktail. So it allows senescent cells to undergo cell death and they were able to show that um, this uh, can reduce the uh, fibrotic response in their model of radiation-induced fibrosis. 
Um, so we've used a similar strategy where uh, with NOx4 inhibition uh, in this aging model of more persistent fibrosis, when we started uh, treatment of these mice with uh, the GKT compound, um, which is developed by a company in Switzerland, and again, I should have mentioned this at, up front, I don't have any conflicts of interest, um, and the, uh, this, uh, or any financial conflicts of interest with this company, but they have developed it and they have uh, sponsored a, uh, an agreement to do some studies with their compound, but uh, I have no personal financial interest and no conflicts in that regard. So what we've, done, what we've shown is that when we treat these mice in this delayed manner over three subsequent weeks, that there is an improvement in their weight gain, there's less fibrosis by total lung collagen, there's improved survival, and that's associated with less um, fibrotic remodeling as well as decreased um, expression of some of these senescence markers. Um, so um, I'm going to focus, how much time do I have Hal, here? Okay, so I'll go have to go faster here now. <laughs> uh, so the AMPK pathway is uh, one that we've become interested in through a collaboration with Yarek at UAB. And what he has shown, um, and this is unpublished data, but I wanted to share uh, this with you because I think it's a potentially exciting strategy, what he's shown is that um, with uh, fibrosis that you get uh, decreased activation of uh, AMPK in fibrogenic cells and that uh, because of this deficiency there is altered turnover of collagen and mitochondrial dysfunction and that, that restitution of this AMPK activation uh, may be a potential strategy to improve the resolution capacity uh, of fibrosis in response to bleomycin. So you can see here uh, that uh, in IPF that um, uh, there are these strands of alpha smooth muscle lactin positive myofibroblasts in green and these cells are relatively deficient uh, in the activation of um, AMPK as evidenced by the phosphorylation of this 3 172 even though the total AMPK uh, is equivalent, there is less, act, uh, here on the right, there's less activation here of um, AMPK, and you can see that quantitated here uh, uh, by uh, cell uh, disaggregation, and you can see it's about, it's almost 50% reduction uh, in the AMPK activation. And we've done some studies to show that this pathway is important in turnover of collagen, and this is uh, in three different cell lines of fibroblasts, and you can see there's some variability in their baseline AMPK activation. But consistently, when you activate AMPK here with ICAR, uh, that you can downregulate their steady state levels of collagen and fibronectin. And you can see that in a dose response here uh, graphically, as, and, and it's associated with the activation of AMPK. Uh, and um, with TGF beta, which is uh, a canonical uh, pathway that we think is important for fibrosis, that it, it again suppresses the upregulation of collagen uh, and uh, fibronectin response to TGF beta. Uh, and you can see that even when we give this uh, drug in a delayed manner after the cells have differentiated into myofibroblasts, that you still get reduction uh, in the steady state levels of those extracellular matrix proteins. Uh, and we were able to replicate that as well with metformin, which, um, as you all uh, may be familiar, it's a drug that's uh, FDA approved for in diabetes and is known to activate AMPK in a similar manner, which we've confirmed. And it also uh, shows here with um, uh, not only metformin, but now loss of function of AMPK with siRNA that you get a super induction of those extracellular matrix proteins suggesting that the AMPK pathway is in some way regulating uh, the expression of these uh, extracellular matrix proteins. So we went on to study um, the mechanisms of how uh, AMPK may be regulating ECM homeostasis, and we were surprised to find, actually, that there was quite a bit of turnover of collagen within the cell as opposed to its extracellular localization and remodeling. So you can see co-localization of 
uh, LC3 expressing autophagosomes with collagen, suggesting that there may be uh, um, turnover uh, of, of collagen within these autophagosomes, and we confirmed that that process is important for the ICAR effect or the activation of AMPK in down-regulating uh, 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 collagen was reversed either when you blocked uh, Becklin, which is an upstream regulator of um, uh, autophagy, or LC3B. Um, so suggesting that autophagy uh, is responsible for the effects that we saw uh, with AMPK. Another uh, pathway that AMPK is critically important regulating is mitochondrial dysfunction. You can see here, as others have shown as well, that mitochondrial dysfunction is, uh, is, does occur in uh, fibroblasts as well as in epithelial cells. And you can see here that there's fragmentation that's evidenced by decreased mitochondrial length. And AMPK is a, is a key uh, uh, energy sensor, and it's important in um, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. And when you have cells that are deficient in AMPK here, these are knockout cells for AMPK. You can see that the bioenergetics of that cell is evidenced by oxygen consumption as well as the reserve capacity of these mitochondria is markedly uh, altered, as is mitophagy, and this ULK1 phosphorylation is a marker of mitophagy. And then this is data showing the, here that, uh, in fact, with uh, in IPF of uh, myofibroblasts, that you can upregulate a number of the uh, complexes that make up the electron transport chain uh, from one to five here. So, uh, again, uh, indicating that in IPF myofibroblasts that, that uh, ICAR or metformin is able to upregulate uh, biogenesis and um, uh, in consistent with our idea that these cells acquire an apoptosis-resistant phenotype, uh, we were able to show that the TGF-beta induced uh, apoptosis resistance uh, is um, reversed when you treat uh, these cells um, with ICAR, so that uh, the restitution of mitochondrial uh, bioenergetics with ICAR allows these cells to undergo normal programmed cell death here in response to antimycin A, which is a, a key inducer of the intrinsic uh, uh, apoptosis uh, pathway, which requires mitochondrial uh, function. Um, and then going back to the animal model, we showed that uh, in these areas where there's very uh, intense accumulation of these alpha smooth muscle lactin positive myofibroblasts, there's a deficiency in AMPK, uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, quantitated here as well to the right. And in, in isolated fibroblasts, uh, we also saw uh, a decrease in AMPK from the uh, bleomycin injured animals. <clears throat> so then for uh, proof of concept that a drug uh, such as metformin could be um, antifibrotic, we uh, treated these bleomycin um, injured mice at a, in a delayed manner at 10 days post-injury. Uh, and you can see here every other day with intraperitoneal injection um, uh, until day 28, you can see there's marked uh, decrease in the fibrotic response, uh, quantitated here with hydroxyproline and, and less accumulation of um, alpha smooth muscle lactin. So um, to end on time, uh, or close to it, I, this is my summary of uh, what I think uh, we should consider IPF as a disease of aging. Uh, it's clearly associated with the accumulation of senescent myofibroblasts as well as um, epithelial cells. There's an imbalance in the NOx4 NRF2 um, uh, balance that, that then contributes to myofibroblast senescence and, and that might impair uh, the resolution capacity. We think that NOx4 inhibitors may function as senolytics uh, to promote the resolution of fibrosis and enhance regenerative capacity. And then a take home point uh, for us to think on a broader scale is that geroscience or linking the biology of aging to chronic disease may offer some novel therapeutic strategies that we haven't considered previously. 
Um, so I will end with that. I'll thank my group here at uh, UAB, a number of uh, whom I've collaborated and worked with. And uh, I will end there and take any questions. Thank you.